Aesthetics are a major part of this channel, and honestly what's most important to me when it comes to enjoying a piece of media. Things like the shot of a scene, the animation direction, the artistic flair, design, sound, and lighting choices. These things make up the greater whole of something than possibly what that piece of media is even trying to say. My last video was largely about Tenjo Tenge, a manga that I had an endless list of issues and complaints to make, but still spent months of my life to make a project that just bragged about its art, the details, that exact aesthetic sense that I just love. Vibes mean a lot to me, and if that shit is good, then man, I'm vibing right back. And thankfully for myself, I've grown to be super open-minded towards most styles and can find details in almost everything Thing that I'd say are beautiful, fun, or just raw as hell. And today, I want to talk about a very specific aesthetic style, one that's been surrounding me like my entire life. So I was born in 1995, and as of 2023, I'm 28 years old, basically a decaying corpse awaiting its final death. If you're around my age now, you remember back in like middle to high school how there was those one or two kids that were like obsessed with the nightmare before Christmas? Jack Skellington was their actual Lord God King and they posted on their MySpace about how the This Is Halloween cover by Marilyn Manson legitimately changed their lives. I swear man, Tim Burton straight up altered an entire generation with both this and Beetlejuice too of course. Kids went from white bread boring to spooky scary overnight after seeing them. And I mean, hell, I get why. Nightmare Before Christmas fucking slaps. The almost legendary stop motion animation and models, super catchy songs, motherfucking oogie boogie. The Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 levels, they're timeless. So timeless in fact, that after kids saw this movie and the vibrant Halloween graveyard bash vibe it gave off, they craved more. Why do you think spooky season in quotes is such a big cultural thing. Why all these TV stations, websites, people all over the earth treat Halloween like it's bigger than Jesus and Santa combined? You can trace a direct line back to Nightmare, probably. And from that genesis, spooky Halloween aesthetics exploded into the world. And I don't mean horror dark ass vibes, nah nah nah. We're talking jack-o'-lanterns and bats, huge crescent moons with howling wolves in the distance, paintings with eyes that follow you around the room, skeletons clambering around and shadows moving when you're not looking, some real scooby-doo ass shit. And for kids growing up in the mid 2000s who had taken such a love to those exact designs, there was one series that was literally made for them. One manga and anime that took this exact Halloween vibe and combined it with Battle Shonen in a way that, honestly, no one else has really been able to match yet. So in this Halloween video that's months late again just like Helsing last year, you already know I'm here to talk about Soul Eater by the guy himself at Sushi Okubo, a series that takes these vibes and makes them into something filled with both vibrant fun and a dark madness. But before we dive into the manga itself, let's talk about Okubo in his first series, B Ichi. So first up, Atsushi Okubo never really had any dream to be a manga artist. By his own admission, as a kid he never really read much manga, the only series he spent meaningful time with being Dr. Slump. As he grew older and would spend free time in his class drawing on notebooks to make his friends laugh, he noticed his actual talents were pretty strong and thought to himself, well, if I was a manga artist I could make my own schedule, working when and how I want, something that by his own admission is what was most important to him in finding a job, to which I say, hell yeah dude, working a daily 7.30 to 5 shift is some ass, I get where he's coming from. His teachers had told his parents during high school that he he wasn't exactly a star student, them straight up saying nothing can be done for him. So fearing that their son would end up living a pointless life, they encouraged him to draw since he did have talent in that area. Okubo eventually attending an art college after high school and meeting up with Rando Ayamine, the creator of Get Backers, becoming his assistant on the manga, all the while in the background cooking up his debut series, B Ichi, or B1 as it's technically called. The story eventually being accepted into monthly shonen Gon Gon, which is a magazine imprint ran by Square Enix, B Ichi running for four total volumes. 
Now, personally, after reading it for myself for this video, it's a bit rough. Following the story of Shotaro, it takes place in a world where people called Dokeshi can use like 50% of their total brain power and are able to gain special abilities from it, but at the cost of requiring to follow certain restrictions to access them. Shotaro, being a Dokeshi himself, can chew on the bones of animals to then gain that animal's physical traits letting him attack with beastly strength or fly away with the wings of a crow. He's like a grosser version of Animal Man. Okay, so just now in editing, I got the pun that b Ichi being called B1 means it's fucking, it's called fucking Bone. That shit's goofy. I love it. But with his personal Dokeshi restriction, must do a good deed daily to offset the power usage or he could lose something inside of himself. When Shotaro was younger, he had a friend with a very similar trait to his, also a Dokeshi that could access hidden power. Except his restriction was the opposite of Shotaro's, him having to commit an evil deed daily where Shotaro was doing good ones, causing them to eventually split apart and him leaving Shotaro alone in the world due to their exact opposite nature. And from here, honestly, the story doesn't really go anywhere. There are plot elements like the Masked Assembly and Apple Shinoda, No Fix, Mana and tool, but honestly, they feel kind of flat. The series itself was only four volumes, and it being monthly, that means it only got about 20 chapters before an abrupt ending, an ending that was likely a cancellation, but it could have been a mutual agreement, who knows? But in only 20 chapters, it feels like it just finished setting up the actual plot for the story and the characters that would be in it, only to end on a total cliffhanger. That being said, the reason it's worth talking about and what I want to showcase is how it's full of the ideas that would go on to make Soul Eater what it is. The character designs all have these super rounded features in their eyes, faces, and bodies, all while still keeping these sharp and pointed edges in their hairstyles, and it creates this unique clash in his cast. It feeling so 1990s, looking young and simple, but still being able to use those sharper parts to create an extremely stylized action shot often covering things in these super dark shadows and black shading. And along with that shading in the characters, it extends out into the world itself, which if anything is the biggest trademark Okubo goes on to have in all of his manga. That being the wild ass super stylish settings the stories all take place in. And Biichi is no different, taking place in a weird alternate version of our world. The city Toikyo being where Shotaro lives, the town itself being like an odd mashup of cultures, ideas, and wild designs. All with that trademark Okubo moon grinning up in the sky. Lastly, and honestly one of the biggest things he carries over, is the focus on madness as a concept. Like the inner mind of a person breaking down and then becoming the most vile, twisted versions of themselves possible. This is a major factor in his manga after B.E.G., and it's one that we'll talk about more soon. But going back and seeing it here so early in his writing, Bro was always prepared to cook in ways that no one was expecting yet. Personally, outside of these early markings of what he would go on to do, the rest of B.E.G. is kinda mid. The plot itself, while being left on a cliffhanger like I said, doesn't really have anything that interesting going on for it outside of the world itself. Just an evil organization being evil while the main hero and his newfound crew do the right thing to try and stop them. All the while an evil childhood friend was out there that never got to matter in the plot at all. So after finishing Volume 4, while it is an overall shame that it ended this way, I can't say that I don't get it. But where I think Biichi fell short in a few ways, Okubo's return with his next series would be the exact opposite turn of events, launching a worldwide hit that to this day is still extremely celebrated. And enough of all this intro bullshit, let's finally get in there and talk about Soul Eater.
So, shortly after the ending of Biichi in June of 2003, Okubo submitted a one-shot to Gon Gon Powered, another one of Square's manga imprints, it being titled Soul Eater and featuring a punk-ass kid named Soul who drooled a lot, with a very specific early 2000s lazy edge to him, and his partner Maka Albarn, a spunky hot-headed girl with a stylish school outfit. Maka is described as a Meister, a German word that's used to describe a person who is exceptionally skilled at a particular activity. But in this story, it's more of a general title. And where she is a Meister, her skill is focused into being a Masterclass Scythe user, with her previously mentioned partner Soul Eater, just called Soul, turning himself into the Scythe she uses, him being what's called a Demon Weapon. Together, these two live in this Halloween town-ass world where it's literally spooky season all season all the time, them being assigned by the school they attend to protect the town by patrolling the streets and looking for motherfucking Jack the Ripper, him being the same serial killer he always was, Maka using soul as her weapon and slicing him down with ease, Jack's corrupted soul itself reaped from his body and just kind of floating there, floating until soul pops back out of his scythe with a drool running down his mouth, grabbing and eating the killer's soul, now almost up to his 100 soul quota given by the school's headmaster, having 99 total. So in this world, after a Meister and their weapon have consumed 99 total souls of humans that have fallen into a wicked evilness, they then have a second goal that's given out by their school, the DWMA, standing for Death Weapon Meister Academy, and that's to hunt down and consume a witch's soul for their final 100th. And once that condition is met, the weapon who's been eating all of these souls transforms and becomes a death scythe, a weapon worthy of being wielded by the school's headmaster, Death himself. This goal in mind, the duo start their hunt for a witch who just happens to live in a giant pumpkin and turns into a cat with a hat, her name being Blair. Blair the Witch, did you get it? Halloween! After chasing Blair around town in both her cat and human form, the witch using both pumpkin-based spells to attack the two and also just general fan service on Soul specifically, yeah we'll, we'll talk more about this aspect later, she makes her final stand and tries to use her boobs to win Soul over to her side, which he in his own words is too cool to betray a friend like that. Soul and Maka using their trust and teamwork with each other to win the fight, Soul finally being able to eat a witch's soul and becoming a death scythe, him transforming into a weapon fit for death himself to use, only realizing after swallowing it that uh, that ain't a witch's soul, in fact it was just a cat, and yeah Blair is a cat with magic powers because fuck you, <laughs> meaning that Soul's final soul was incorrect. The duo failing the test and forcing him and Maka to start back at Soul 1, them heading off in the night to begin the hunt again. And what happened next was something no one really expected. So after this one shot was published, Okubo got word back from the editors that fans really enjoyed his Soul Eater one shot, and higher ups were asking for more. But instead of jumping right into the series itself, Okubo repeated his last steps and again dropped a one shot into the pages of Gon Gon around September of 2003, this one titled Black Star, focusing on the same Soul and Witch concepts from the original Soul Eater chapter, but featuring a new duo. The weapon Tsubaki, a girl who can turn herself into a whole ass arsenal of ninja weapons like she's 1010 but better, teamed together with the one and only motherfucking man himself, Ninja Meister Blackstar, them infiltrating a mafia meeting to take down Al Capone. <laughs> this one shot, just like the first, used those same aesthetics and ideas while featuring a new duo that went to the same school and worked for Death himself, and just the same as the first, was super popular with the readers, the editors coming back again and asking for another one, Okubo, pulling a three-peat, did the same thing again with a one-shot, dropping this one around November of 2003 and titling it Death the Kid, 
focusing on the title dropped character himself, Death the Kid, and his two duo weapons, Liz and Patty, sisters who transform into twin Berettas that Kid very famously holds upside down and fires with his pinkies. I told you bitches I'm all about aesthetics, and this right here, that's aesthetic. Losers try to hate on this, but they're wrong and dumb. This goes hard. Who cares if it's stupid? Death the Kid is, well, Death's Kid. The same death from the other two one-shots. Kid himself going on a personal mission for his dad to subdue a mummy that's getting a bit too rowdy in his ancient pyramid. And with these three combined one-shots, the world of Soul Eater was firmly established. The Meister and weapons of the DWMA serving under Lord Death to exercise the world of evil elements and help keep a natural balance among the living and the dead. After dropping this Death the Kid chapter in November, Okubo would spend the next few months gearing up to begin full serialization on his series Soul Eater, it officially starting in Monthly Shonen Gon Gon on May 12th of 2004 running for 25 total volumes and ending in August of 2013. Monthly Shonen Gon Gon itself is a magazine which is most famously known for both Soul Eater and the other big time shonen hit Full Metal Alchemist, which I mainly only bring up as an excuse to show off this official art from one issue of the magazine. As of now in 2023, Soul Eater has sold over 20 million copies of the manga had its own spin-off series called Soul Eater Not, got an extremely famous anime adaptation, multiple video games released, and most notably, has made Okubo a whole-ass worldwide name. The dude is extremely popular here in America, and for good reason. He very obviously is a teen of the 90s, and his ideas, references, art, and plot beats all bleed that same blood that ran through everything from like 95 to 04. Things that at the time were extremely popular with moody ass teenagers and emo kids like I was. But what exactly makes his manga so unique? What is that special sauce bros cooking with? I want to try and break down why I think his manga has such a unique flair from art to story to characters. So first up as we dive deeper into the mad world that is Soul Eater, let's talk first about the insanity that is Okubo's worlds, them all being created hand in hand with his stylish as hell art. The first thing I noticed about Soul Eater, just like so many other people, was absolutely its Halloween vibes. My initial exposure to the series was through the anime. I actually remember the first time I saw it. I was at a buddy's house around like 2013-ish probably, and like I've said before in other videos, this was around the time I started to get back into anime after falling out of it for so many years, and I was taking new suggestions left and right on what to watch. So one night while I'm at dude's house chilling with some friends, he turns on an anime he had been re-watching, one he said he had loved for a while now, that of course being Soul Eater. I mentioned I hadn't seen or knew anything about it, and bro was blown away, a real life moment of that one friend who loudly yells, YOU HAVEN'T SEEN DEATH NOTE, it was just like that, and he stopped the episode he was watching and he turned on the first one instead. Then about 25 minutes later, I said to him, well goddamn, I guess I'll be watching this too, and later that night watched episodes 2 and 3 when I got home. Shout out my dude Kojak for plugging me into this one. I was still probably around like 19 or so at the time, so this shonen ass series with the emo goth aesthetic hit me right in the chest. Not to mention the very blatant Twin Peaks reference with the dancing man in a red checkerboard room like this shit was a laser target straight to my heart. I'll touch more on the rest of this story with me and the anime later, but it wasn't until years down the road, around like 2020, when I finally sat down and read all of Soul Eater after buying some of those newly released perfect editions, and holy shit dude, I was not expecting what was inside. The anime set the stage for the vibe and designs, but it was with the manga where I first really experienced Okubo's art, and it blew me the fuck away. From the first one-shots, 
His style was already so unique and interesting, his characters having these off-base proportions and almost looking like early Shaman King designs. These boxy arms and legs, big rounded heads and huge eyes, but all while looking so fucking cool, like his designs just radiate this dope ass youthful energy that looks super unconventional and hella 90s, like this shit's straight out of a Gorillaz music video. All the while flexing how he can draw these kinetic and visually fluid fight scenes, the minute to minute combat being so easy to follow and focus on, all while dripping that same flair he puts into the calmer shots of the characters or the world itself. His expressions shift from cool, smooth, and confident over to loud, bombastic, and extreme at the drop of a hat, Okubo always keeping a steady balance of both the lighthearted and wacky shit he obviously loves to draw, but then hammering down and flexing his true talent when the shit starts to pop off during a fight. This all being done while keeping up that same sense of flair and aesthetic that's been in the art from the start, taking the combat up to a whole new level. Fights being flashy as fuck, but all the while leading you on from panel to page in a perfect flow. In between the fights and the characters of the story, you have the actual world itself everything takes place in. It being so fucking thick with detail and design that it feels like every location in the story is a uniquely thought out and planned part of the world. The streets of Death City are filled with pumpkins, the streetlights bending and looming over the sidewalks. The buildings all have their pointed fence rows, tall towers covered in skulls that are surrounded by dark alleys. The sky itself reflects the aesthetic too, the stars having a storybook look to them while the actual giant ass moon itself grins and stares down on the world, blood running out of its mouth. The sun also has his own face and demeanor laughing happily up in the sky during a normal sunny day, blasting total ass in super hot parts of the globe, and then dying of dehydration before the moon rises back at night. Outside of the world design being just so Halloween, the actual shit that fills the world is wildly fun and uses that October vibe. The soul eating concept is already interesting enough, but them chasing the souls of people like Jack the Ripper and Al Capone their teacher being Dr. Frankenstein, the reanimated zombie teacher Sid Barrett, named after the former lead singer of Pink Floyd before he LSD'd his brain to death. Like Okubo just stuffs his series full of references to shit that is obviously appealing to him in one way or another, and translates them in his own flashy style that oozes cool. The world itself is a weird version of our world, same as Biichi sharing names and places but being totally different and fantastical. DWMA and Death City seem like they exist in some strange alternate reality, especially when you look at the town as a whole. But then a call comes through and says, oh yeah, no, this school's just in fucking Nevada. Like, huh? Huh? Where? What? Uh, who cares? It's interesting, so fuck it. The series is genuinely funny too, characters like Excalibur completely destroying me each time they appeared on screen. Him taking up whole pages and just talking over dialogue and annoying characters and possibly the reader, spending so much time rambling that he forces the text boxes to the center of the books, the gutters, to which Blackstar says, bro fucking stop, you're making the manga hard to read. Is it stupid? Yeah, sure, but it goes such an extra mile in establishing both the world the story takes place in, along with the idiots who are in it. Also, like many other artists who were young at the start of their careers, you gotta remember that Okubo was born in 1979, so that means when Soul Eater started in 2003, Okubo was only 24 years old, and still being fairly young at the time, you can see it reflect in tons of ways. One big thing being that bro is horny as hell, characters like Blair existing for one reason and mostly that reason only, the series itself even kind of ending on a boob joke. This is a trait that really amps up the further you get into his career, but that's a story for another video. Not a thing that necessarily turns me off of a series, but I get why someone would definitely be like, eh, so take it as you will, especially if you're gonna read Fire Force. 
Despite me saying earlier that Okubo had no real interest in manga growing up, he obviously must have a huge love for creating art in general. Like the amount of color pages in Soul Eater, both in the manga and in separate art books, is over the top and not even just the sheer number of them, but also in the level of styles and design choices he makes. Tons of them popping up throughout the series that show off this exact design sense in full beauty them all being so vibrant and wild, style switching through them constantly like he's DMC5 Dante, really big fan of the ones made to look like graffiti. And this was a thing stretching all throughout Soul Eater, his next manga Fire Force. And honestly, just like in general, he draws character art for anime, video games, other manga, my dude loves to draw. And his style just keeps growing over time, and in my opinion, getting so much cooler and always dripping with the unique and immediately identifiable look that he's created for himself. Like if I see eyes and mouths like this, yeah, I can tell right away that that's him. And when it comes to the actual designs of the world and the things in it, Okubo has mentioned that he took a lot of inspiration from the modern artist Edward Gorey, someone who before this video I had never heard of honestly despite them being super prominent throughout history, them only passing away in the year 2000, god damn 2000 was 23 years ago huh? And now looking into their art, not only is it cool as hell, holy shit it's so obvious that Soul Eater is 1000% directly inspired from him. Honestly this piece in particular, the cover for his short storybook The Gashly Crumb Tinies, an alphabetical book where 26 kids with names representing the A through Z letters die in individual ways. <laughs> but the cover specifically, this right here is Soul Eater. Kids huddled together under the watchful protection of death itself, his small umbrella somehow covering all of the kids in its shadow. You can absolutely see the translation of Gory's style into Okubo's art. And it's such a cool place to draw inspiration from, taking these super striking but odd ideas about death and making them into a shonen battle manga involving the souls of two people being connected together. And on that subject, those soul connections are one of the most important factors in the entire manga. It both being what the series is kinda named after, and the souls of the entire cast being prominent parts of the story, both metaphorically and literally. In Soul Eater, everyone has a soul, usually with a cool ass design that reflects their personality, be it a human, witch, werewolf, whatever. And that soul gives off a certain type of wavelength, it's kind of like an unhearable radar sound. That wavelength can be used to connect two souls together, then achieving soul resonance and basically becoming a single unit. The two souls sharing both thoughts and feelings between them to sync together and fight off enemies. This being the foundation for the Meister and Weapon combos that I mentioned earlier. Them working like cogs in a machine to create a greater power together. The series has a great way of summing it up honestly. A Meister's wavelength is like a small sound, but when paired up with a weapon, their wavelength becomes like an amp for the Meister, broadcasting their sound, their soul, loudly and proudly, achieving soul resonance and beating the shit out of a corrupted soul. Maka, while not being as physically strong as Black Star or Kid, has an insane level of soul perception that being the ability to feel and see soul wavelengths, a power so strong that it makes her a target from the enemies of the series. Literally just because the ability to feel someone's soul is so dangerous and powerful, basically letting Maka become a human GPS that can detect anyone in the world by their soul alone. Even if they should be somewhere far as hell away, like on the moon. <laughs> She's like that kid from Heroes, but we are not having another Heroes discussion in a manga video. There is a reverse to these wavelength abilities, a soul rejection basically, which can happen when a Meister attempts to use a weapon that their soul is incompatible with for whatever reason, resulting in the weapon itself being way too heavy for the Meister to use and causing a violent reaction from the wavelength inside the weapon 
damaging the hell out of their body. Soul was puking up blood when Blackstar tried to hold him that one time, but at least their breakup was smooth and they remained friends. This soul resonance is the main way the cast can fight against the madness that's taking over the world. So their ability to bond with and understand the souls of their partners is extremely important to the three main meisters of the series, and along with the rest of the cast, use their combined wavelengths to create wildly devastating attacks that can cut through the souls of their enemies. Maka's Witch Hunt Slash, Kid's Death Cannon, Blackstar's Uncanny Sword Mode. These techniques all demand pitch perfect sync between Meister and Weapon, creating even bigger and way wilder attacks with just the power of Soul itself. Due to the nature of the series' plot, most of the combat is very weapon-focused. Be it scythes, guns, swords, spears, gauntlets, tonfo, whatever. And the use of weapons always feels masterful in their combat flow, blending together the battles and the story itself on a whole new level since not only are the Meisters fighting, their weapons themselves are characters too and contribute to the fights in really fun and interesting ways. Like seeing Soul's arm just come out of a scythe blade or his arm itself turning into that same blade is really fun and weird to me. Like it's really charming body horror, just an extremely cool concept. In my last video on Air Gear and Tenjo Tenge, I mentioned one of my favorite things Ogreat used in his manga was the over-the-top levels of flair and unrelenting cool factor in every piece of art he drew. And despite the styles being very different, Okubo functions in the exact same way. Constant outfit updates, flashy accessories, and stylish poses that feel designer as hell. And as the series went on and Okubo's talents grew, his art changed along with him and, in my opinion, reached the final form of aesthetic he had been chasing for so long. As much as I loved this 90s ass style, the designs in his characters and creatures grow so far past what it was during the beginning. Everything being so dense in line work, shading, even more accessories in a much grander scale. The cast who started the series in a much simpler style, both growing in terms of character progression and character design. Some elevating to a whole new level and standing tall, while others slip off into madness and then being drawn like some fucking horrific monsters. The juxtaposition between his pretty, wild, and silly art with his super heavy and imposing shading. The world still retaining that lighthearted Halloween vibe, but slowly slipping into whole ass horror when he wants. The eyes of the Kishin slowly filling the story and being used to convey that growing madness. And when you combine it with that battle shown in Formula, it makes an action series that feels totally unique in tons of ways since a lot of these fights involve the main heroes themselves falling into pits of madness, but always dripping with raw coolness. I got a big ass manga collection, fans of the channel know that, and a part of that collection is art books. I don't have a whole lot of them unfortunately, some of the ones I wanted most are kind of out of print and super expensive, but I catch myself coming over here and grabbing Okubo So Art 2 all of the time. Volume 1 had a yen press print, but good luck finding that for a decent price. And flipping through these pages because god damn man, I just love how simple yet meticulous his art can be. Soul drooling all of the time, Black Star stylizing his name as Black Star with a big ass star logo. Kid's symmetrical use of his pistols and three white hairlines. Soul Eater is filled with so much cool aesthetical shit and moody vibes that if anything, I think it's worth the read already based on that. Look at death here, this is like a perfect design, I have no notes no improvements could ever be made. He's got the big ass glove to smack you around with too, just an all around 10 out of 10, he nailed it. Death even had a badass mask he used to wear when he was much more hardcore and said some wild shit, and now only wears this soft rounded one so he doesn't scare his students. A literal perfect character, I swear. Okubo also very proudly features black characters in his stories, stretching from Biichi to Soul Eater and then on into Fire Force. Him saying in an interview from 2009 that there's a severe lack of characters with any kind of black or African descent in manga and he wanted to include them. And honestly, tons of other cultures from around the world as well. Like, Soul Eater is an incredibly diverse series at the end of the day, 
Shout out that one time Kid had to confront Death about maybe basically destroying Baghdad. And unlike a lot of other series that try and add those inclusions in, they never feel accidentally derogatory like Joko Love or King Bucha can be. Ogun and Fire Force actually be one of the dopest characters in that whole fucking manga, so that's pretty cool. Another personal praise of mine, but I'm kind of obsessed with manga and anime that have sick ass eye designs. Like complain all you want about the Sharingan, Rinnegan, and all that, but each time Sasuke unlocked a new one, I popped off because I I'm a sucker for this shit. And goddamn, does Okubo use this aesthetic trait in his characters over and over? And each time. I'm going monkey mode because it whips ass and I fucking love it. But past the character and world design sensibilities, there is a core to Soul Eater, a soul if you will, <laughs> like, comment, subscribe, goddammit, and it's absolutely found in its main cast, the stars of the earlier mentioned one-shot chapters. So now, let's dive into each of these three teams and what makes them all totally great in my eyes, starting with the name of the game himself, Soul Eater, and his gentle iron fist of a partner, Maka Albarn. The first time I had watched Soul Eater on my own after Dude had shown it to me, one of my biggest takeaways was that it felt like Maka, and by extension Soul, were kinda way less enjoyable than Black Star and Kid. Like those two were both stronger, cooler, and way more unique in their personality. And then over here you had a generic protagonist who gets stronger through the power of shonen ass pulls. Thankfully, that was like 10 years ago and I'm no longer stupid, because despite me loving Kid and Blackstar endlessly and probably having them both in a top 10 characters of all time list, that doesn't discount Maka or Soul at all, and in fact I think they're both perfect examples of what the core of the story is about. That being, growth through human connections. As the star of the story, despite Maka and Soul being solid partners, they are far from perfect for each other. Maka unable to understand every part of Soul, and he himself refusing to show her all of it in the first place. Maka is very short-tempered, hot-headed, and a bit proud of herself. She makes great grades in class and is popular among the students due to both her parents' status in the school, her dad being one of Death's personal weapons and her mom being one of the most famous Meisters in history. And on top of that, she's a genuinely good person, going out of her way to help classmates and friends in any way she can. But, for as proud and strong-willed as she can be, a large chunk of that is kind of a front, Maka actually feeling more often than not like she isn't measuring up to her own expectations, and instead is falling behind the legacy of her parents while holding her partner Soul back. Maka not being strong enough to keep herself safe while using Soul as a weapon, forcing him to come out of the scythe to block attacks and protect her. These attacks almost killing Soul and haunting Maka for needing that protection in the first place. And when it comes to her parents and their legacy, her dad's spirit is kind of a total asshole. Him cheating on Maka's mom nonstop and her eventually divorcing him, leaving Maka to see her dad, someone who the world calls a champion in her former personal hero as a scuzzy ass lowlife who broke a promise to his partner, both giving her a fair bit of trust issues and that exact feeling of letting your partner down being something she herself already struggles with in soul, reflected right back at her in the worst way possible from her shitty dad, causing Maka to resent the hell out of him for the way he acts, spirit spending most of his time on screen schmoozing on women or being pathetic in general. And on the flip side of this coin, you have Soul, him being so cool and uncaring in how he acts. Where Maka is the loud, brash, no-nonsense leader, Soul is the total opposite, the kind of guy who likes to stay in the background. He doesn't care about attention, he doesn't want to make a big splash in school, he just goes with the flow of the moment and wants to move to the tune of his own soul always trying to be kind of above it all and as careless as possible. But like before with Maka and her outward personality, this is largely just a front. While Soul is naturally the cool guy who likes to seem aloof and eternally chill, he's extremely self-conscious about his ability, both as a weapon that's supposed to protect Maka and as a person himself with the things he enjoys doing. 
The guitar and amp metaphor I used earlier applies directly to soul. Him playing a grand piano in his soul to send out a song of wavelength that connects with Maka, drawing their power out together. But despite him playing this internal piano to connect with other souls, he refuses to play for any of his friends, Maka included, outside of his soul world. Him acting like he's too cool to bother with that shit. But inside, he's struggling with the fact that his older brother was also a great musician, and Soul was seen as the kid in his brother's shadow. Always Soul and, and never just Soul himself. Causing him to lose sight of what he had that was unique or special in any way, anything that gave him a purpose, until he learned about his weapon abilities, immediately signing up for the DWMA and leaving home forever. It's not so much that he wasn't as good as his brother, he would never know how good he really was. Him finding the confidence and help he needed from his future partner, Maka. Them both having their own internal struggles and battles with the madness that the world throws at them, but always growing together, becoming better partners and better friends. Okubo said himself that he actively chose to have Maka as the lead role in the series, wanting the main character to be a girl. In his own poorly translated words from French to English in some old ass interview, shonen manga is aimed at boys, usually featuring male leads to the stories. But when you really get down to it, just as many girls read shonen manga as boys now, especially in 2023, and despite this series still 100% being a shonen, he wanted to try and bridge the gap for readers with having a girl who struggles and grows along with her cool ass male partner in the lead. Both of these genders having the same 50-50 shared importance to the story. And based on the love I've seen for Maka over the years, I think he was totally correct in that choice. As the series goes on, Maka makes active changes in herself to build on the lack of confidence, acknowledging her mistakes and not being as stubborn in her thoughts, eventually becoming a level-headed and extremely competent leader to the Meister Trio, learning to properly trust other people again after being betrayed by her dad. And on the other side, Soul goes from an almost arrogant level of aloofness to becoming extremely mature and level-headed, him keeping a firm hold on everyone's souls and never losing himself to the madness that he willingly throws himself in. It's not always an easy path. Soul can be headstrong and act in ways that he thinks are best to protect Maka, willing to throw himself in harm's way if it means that she's okay, and Maka in turn giving into that same madness if it means never letting Soul get hurt like he did before. Both of them slipping up because they're trying to protect each other with disregard to themselves. But it's when they both come together and accept every part of their souls that they can mature past their anxiety that one has to protect the other. And instead, both move as a unit like 50 in the crew, uniting their power together and cutting down the madness in their way. And where they cut through the madness, beside them is Death the Kid, along with his two guns Liz and Patty, the trio instead blasting the madness away with bullets. And that said, let's talk about them next! So without a doubt, the most famous part of Soul Eater, the thing that brought in tons of first time fans on the anime's release, was 1 billion percent Death the Kid, him becoming the poster child for like 2000s anime, and for pretty good reason. The son of Death himself, who wears a suit and tie, has three white half lines in his jet black hair, holding his dual pistols upside down and firing them with his pinkies, all while being a freak crippled by insane OCD that completely controls his life. Him obsessing over the most minor details to the point where it's an actual hindrance in fights, and even a way to physically torture him when things are not in perfect symmetry. His OCD breaking his brain and forcing him to abandon whatever goal he had, and now try to recreate the missing symmetry. The dude even obsessing over the number 8 because it's, guess what, perfectly symmetrical. Between the design, the pistols, the over-the-top personality, yeah, no shit the mid-2000s wool so random invader zim generation ate this shit up. 
Fucking Megan the Stallion dressed as him for Halloween this year, and Xavier Wolf has the kid whip in the first light music video. The dude's reach across pop culture is insane, and it absolutely drew in the masses for Soul Eater itself. Him winning every popularity poll the series ever had, because of course he did! And when it comes to Kid himself and how he functions in the story, I love the dude. Like I had said, he's the son of death. So together with his dual weapon sisters Liz and Patty, his job in the world and place in the story are a bit different from Maka and Blackstar. Having the soul of a Shinigami, Kid has no reason to hunt the witch's souls like the rest of his classmates. Hell, he isn't even technically supposed to be a DWMA student. He just saw Maka and Blackstar getting their ass whipped by Stein and enrolled on the spot through his dad to go and help them in some official capacity, and then kinda just stuck around after that because honestly it's a great learning experience for the future King of Death, even if his focus in school is different from everyone else's. So, having a role in the story that does doesn't focus on witches' souls, Kid is instead sent out by death on more personal missions. Things that are deemed on his level since naturally because of who he is, his power is a step up from the rest. While on a mission once over in New York because, like I said, this all just takes place in our world I guess, he met the Thompson sisters Liz and Patty, who at the time were street punk ass kids that robbed dudes for cash, them being found and rescued by Kid, him then offering them a chance to become his weapon. The sisters only actually accepting his deal with the plan to eventually later rob him, and Liz went in to get her younger sister Patty off the streets. But eventually coming to really care about Kid since he was such a goofbag, Patty actually smiling happily and enjoying her new life. Liz in turn feeling happy for how comfortable they are with Kid. Where Maka and Soul function as two separate characters that each contrast with each other and have to work through their differences, the trio of Kid and the sisters is pretty different, them all having complete faith and trust in each other creating perfect soul resonance and picking up the slack where one of the three may be lacking. That usually being Kid with his OCD forcing him to contemplate bailing on a battle mid-fight so he can go and make sure the toilet paper was folded correctly on the roll, leaving Liz to wrangle both his dumbass and Patty's half-insane ass together, trying to keep them both on track. Something that gets easier for her to do is Kid has to confront the madness from the past that was left behind by his dad, him facing down the insanity of the world itself and it maturing him to becoming the Shinigami he was created to be. Kid does have more I want to talk about here in a bit, but outside of the basic things I've covered, Kid is without a doubt one of the more straightforward characters of the main cast, his personal character arc revolving way less about himself and instead more so about the mystery of the world and how the things that have been going on in it affect him. And that's not a bad thing at all, he is who he is, and even if the world itself is falling apart around him, he's able to take that power of the god of death that he has inside, and lead everyone towards the light at the end of the tunnel. It's fucked up how almost no other series have even a hint of the level of sauce the kid has in like every aspect of his character. Just a straight up home run to the hearts of people born in the 1990s. But we aren't done yet. There's one more major player in this cast, and in my opinion, I've saved the best for last. You know him, you better fucking love him, it's time for the star himself to shine, Black Star and Tsubaki are here to take center stage. So right up front, I'll say loud and proud that Black Star is easily, without a doubt, my absolute favorite top one character from Soul Eater. Being an extremely self-confident, kind of stupid and over-the-top ninja, Blackstar was born from a famous group of assassins known as the Star Clan, them being well known in the world for their skills and ruthlessness, hated and feared by tons of people who have suffered at their hands. The clan itself one day completely giving in to madness and attempting to transcend their human forms to become something that exists on like a higher level. The clan killing innocent humans and eating their souls to gain a dark power. Death himself having to step in and wipe the clan out in fear of what they were becoming. Blackstar being the sole surviving baby taken in by the DWMA and raised inside their walls. Due to this backstory, Blackstar has always had an uphill battle, him being the last remaining member of a clan that is hated worldwide. 
growing up in a death combat school without a normal family structure for him to develop in, and Blackstar having to carry all this undeserved baggage from his family's past around him at all times, doesn't really give a fuck. Instead, Blackstar has spent his entire life training, working and grinding his strength and ninja skills. Why? Because he's the goddamn best there's ever been, period! Blackstar looks at the adversity he was born into, the challenges of the world, and loudly yells, bring it the fuck on, charging straight forward with a stubborn and reckless drive to be the best, to be number one. In his world, he's the star of the show. I mean, he's the coolest and strongest, so why wouldn't he be? Diving headfirst into battle with absolutely zero thoughts that he may lose in his head, Blackstar is teamed up with his partner, Subaki a demon weapon from a family that has the ability to become multiple different ninja tools. Similar to Liz and Patty, Tsubaki has a much different relationship with her Meister Blackstar than Maka and Soul have. And despite him being such a loud dipshit who is technically a ninja that just literally can't help refusing to ever be sneaky and instead loudly announces his presence, Tsubaki is always right by his side backing him up with complete faith in his ability them having absolute trust in each other's souls. Tsubaki knows he's hard-headed, she knows he's overconfident and willingly throws himself into absolutely unwinnable situations just to see if he can win, but doesn't get upset with him. She never thinks to herself, well, there's no way for him to win this. She instead just trusts her partner. Them sharing their souls with each other and Blackstar using her multiple ninja tool forms to claw his way to the top. Him becoming the world's strongest warrior and in turn, making Tsubaki the world's strongest weapon. Where she gives Blackstar her total trust, it's up to him to carry out that faith and beat the ass of whoever stands in their way. Him both eager and willing to take on anyone at any time. Blackstar could be described as, I think, therefore I am. Blackstar thinks he's the strongest, the baddest, and the coolest. And due to his intense devotion to that idea, he kind of is the strongest. It doesn't matter how powerful the enemy is, how fast or smart they may be. To Blackstar, he's just better than them naturally and doesn't give a shit about the idea of losing. It never even crosses his mind. He's number one. He's the best. He goes to new sides of the world and spins around in circles. So the Earth's rotation resets with him as the center of gravity. Because to him, he's the goddamn center of the world, the whole universe. And that's it, dude. Number one at the top and good luck ever bringing him down. The entire cast of the series admitting over and over that even if he is a loud shithead, that he's truly unstoppable. The king at the absolute top. And because of his insane devotion, he really can be called the strongest. This is one of my favorite character tropes, I can't help it. Just the absolute idiots who happen to be incredibly strong. A thing Okubo continues to do in Fire Force and guess who my favorite there is too? Blackstar's motivation to gain power and strength could almost be called madness in a way. A madness that infects his mind and makes him crave that power sometimes even willing to throw away who or whatever in order to gain what he feels like is missing. And with that thought and our main Meister trio established, let's finally talk about the true core of the series. And uh, full spoilers from here forward until we get to the anime discussion, so here's a time card if you want to skip ahead to that. Cool. If you've read or watched Soul Eater and been paying attention, it's probably obvious that there's one large aspect to the series I keep dancing around but not outright diving into, the thing that stretches out from the chapters of Biichi, starting again in Soul Eater, and it growing through the whole series until a worldwide breaking point that begins to tear everyone's minds apart. Of course, this would be the concept of madness itself, and how it infects every single aspect of the story, characters, combat, and world. In Soul Eater, the concept of madness stretches far past the general idea of real-life insanity, and yeah, sure, that's still a massive part of it here, 
but it's born from a way deeper core that takes on tons of different forms to our characters. The world itself slowly being sent into madness as the Keishin's rebirth and growth over the story starts to cover the entire planet. The Keishin is a former Meister who fell into madness from his own fear of everything in the world forcing his weapon partner to eat the souls of innocent humans, and him eventually eating his own partner so he could gain the power to wipe away everything he was terrified of. Becoming some kind of fucked up old god that generated pure madness called the Keishin. This new being, unable to be killed by death and instead, the Lord of the Shinigami flaying all of the skin off of him and sealing him in a sack made from that skin. Him hidden deep down below the DWMA under death's watchful soul. But uh, obviously the plot has to happen and the Kishin is set free from his dank ass holding area. The madness his presence gives off slowly filling the whole world and sending the cast down their own roads of insanity to overcome. For Maka and Soul, this madness affects both of them in different ways. Maka's self-confidence issues causing her to lose faith in her ability to properly use and protect Soul, while Soul himself is filled with the black blood of Medusa, a witch who created this synthetic goop for blood, and then filled her child Krona's veins with it. Krona using that blood as a weapon and it cutting Soul while seeping into his wounds. That same injury that sent Maka spiraling into her own self-confidence issues, causing his wavelength to go all fucky and creating that dancing demon I showed off earlier in his soul that's a Twin Peaks reference. The little dude teasing and taunting Soul the entire series into using that black blood as a weapon like Krona does. Soul occasionally giving in to the madness that comes along with it and just going wild. The blood in turn affecting Maka since she is the user holding Soul when he loses control. But where that madness can cause Maka to lose her own identity to herself, it can also be used as a source of power. In Soul Eater, madness may be connected to insanity and cause people to lose their shit, but it's a deeper concept than that showing that madness can be linked to many things in tons of ways. Maka, despite her own personal issues and lack of confidence, never backs down from a challenge, no matter how insane it may be. Knowing she might lose and that there's no room for error, even when her whole body screams she has 0% chance, Maka still gathers up her courage and pushes ahead. A level of courage that goes far past just being brave. Nah, by this point, she's staring gods of madness down in the face and taking them on. Her level of courage almost seeming a bit crazy, a little mad if you will. Spreading that same courage back towards Soul and her teammates in the same way that madness itself can spread through a person. Madness may be a fear that breaks you down, but it can be a reinforcement of your insane ideals to push you forward, to give you that edge in battle. Blackstar is obsessed with power, I've said it before, and it's an obsession that, like any other form of madness, begins to consume his thoughts as the enemies he's fighting keep getting stronger, his easy wins now turning into draws and debatable losses. Blackstar was born from madness, his star clan themselves giving into it and devouring human souls, them having thrown everything away for strength and power, an obsession that's been reborn inside of Blackstar. And as he starts to slide off into that madness, the stars in his eyes reflecting the violent history of his clan, Kid steps the fuck in and whips his ass back down into the ground, reminding Blackstar that his obsession with power and strength was supposed to be for himself and for his partner Subaki, his friends, the DWMA itself that falling into this single-minded obsession was exactly the same path his family had followed before, leading to their own deserved destruction. And even if he doesn't want to listen to Kid at first, it's with the best fight in the manga between him and Mifune that Blackstar really grows up a bit and comes to not only crave that power, but also respect it. He's desperately clawed his way to that level, and was faced down with a rival that only he could defeat, Ninja vs Swordsman, Mifune forcing Blackstar to take their battle to the next step and actually kill him. The samurai letting Blackstar use his death as a tool to grow stronger, to work past that madness inside himself. Blackstar having actually killed a human for the first time and not a corrupted soul or some weird monster freak. 
completely changing him from that point forward. Sure, he's still the same loud asshole, but it's no longer, I'm gonna be the number one star. Nah, that's gone. Now it's, I am the number one star, period. That confidence is replaced by fact. The fact that he's the strongest being in existence. And he's willing to take on anyone who disagrees. Him using that same confidence given to him by Mifune and Kid to, in turn, save Kid himself from madness. Symmetry is a form of perfect order. And with Kid being a Shinigami, he's an entity that's dedicated to preserving the order of life and death, the cycle of living itself. And due to the madness he ends up trapped in infecting his mind, he's left wondering if the best course of action would be to send the world into nothingness and create a form of perfect order, so to speak. To a god of death, everything has to be black or white. Life, death, there's no middle gray area for him to operate in. He has to act with decisiveness, just like his dad before him. The madness in his soul telling him the ultimate order of nothingness, an all blacked out empty reality, would in theory be the perfect solution. But with the help of Blackstar diving into that same madness and beating some sense into Kid's ass, he comes to terms with the concept of order itself and the role that he should play in it, and evolves as a Shinigami both internally and externally, his power growing way past what it was before and him becoming way more accepting to things that are in perfect order. No longer facing eternal soul death if he sees a pretzel with a bite taken out of it or some shit. Side note, but I do really love that Blackstar and Kid both separately step into each other's paths when one is slipping off into madness, beating the hell out of themselves and forcing the other person to realize the asshole they're becoming. Kid is a Shinigami, his power is way greater than anyone else's should be. But of course, that doesn't mean shit to Blackstar. Him willing to fight Kid whenever, and Kid recognizing the fact that Blackstar actually keeps up with him and that itself is worthy of the gods. Confirming every big brag Blackstar ever had about himself. Anyway, Madness, despite being the tool of the enemies and the thing itself that destroys so many people in the story, is also a source of power and stability that can be used as well, all of our main cast evolving it in their own ways to fight back against what's in front of them. But there's one character I've not talked about much at all, and they really are the poster child for the downsides of Madness, both in the manga and in the real world. And that kid, of course, would be Krona, the witch's child whose blood is black. Them using the talking asshole of a sword Ragnarok as a tool for Medusa during most of the series, forced into fighting and experimentation by their fucked up mom. From their earliest memories, Krona was mentally and emotionally abused by Medusa on a regular basis, her forcing Krona to live in a tiny pitch black room with no food or anything until Krona would follow her orders and slaughter a cute puppy for the sole reason of do it because I said so. Medusa slowly breaking down Krona's mind over the years with methods like this, to the point where Krona completely loses themselves, becoming un unable to deal with anything at all before having a total mental breakdown and lashing out at whoever's around with their black blood. As a trauma response, Krona retreats into their desert mind palace, drawing a circle with a stick in the sand and declaring it their safe space that no one is allowed in, then reflected as a small child because inside, that's honestly who they still are. And even with Maka eventually reaching out to Krona, breaking down the sandy walls of their heart and then becoming friends, it doesn't just fix things. Krona attends the DWMA and tries to be a regular student, exploring the massive school grounds with the crew and it being overwhelming for Krona, then going to class and writing the most depressing poetry ever that brings even Blackstar's mood down. But despite it not being an easy transition, Krona still wants that change in their lives, to try and live here in happiness with actual real friends for the first time. The connections they're making slowly helping Krona control the madness they've had forced into them. But Medusa won't let it happen, appearing before Krona yet again in the years of mental abuse they've caused creeping back into their mind making Krona follow their mom's orders once again, betraying the academy and leaving behind the new life they had created here at the school, abandoning the only real friends they had ever had. 
This final straw completely breaks Krona's mind and fully throws them into madness for the rest of the series. A madness that destroys Krona's heart and leaves them completely unable to deal with anything at all anymore. Medusa actually showing motherly love for once in her life, apologizing to Krona for the years of abuse actually hugging their child for probably the first time ever, only for Krona to 100% snap at this totally out of nowhere showing of affection, cutting Medusa down once and for all because like I had said, they just didn't know how to deal with this. Krona, now having betrayed the only friends they ever had and killing their own mother, makes the final descent into madness and says, fuck it, I'ma merge with the Kishin myself. Them heading up to the moon that's loomed over the whole series and now where the final battle actually takes place. This duality and madness between characters like Maka, Blackstar, Dr. Stein, and Soul matched up with how that same madness affected Krona, Justin Law, Giriko, and the Kishin himself kind of feel like parallels to real life obstacles and trauma that one person can face. Struggling with a lack of self confidence, the weight of previous generations weighing your shoulders down, an obsession with religion overriding how you see humanity in general, all the way to the unfortunate reality of actual abuse, both from the people who cause and receive it. Madness represents the human heart's ability to either push against the situation it's facing or fall apart due to the honestly unfair weight of the world destroying someone's life when they never had a choice in the matter, and how through the bonds people can make, the connections between their souls, hopefully we can overcome that madness together working past the things that beat our hearts down and riding the wave of insanity out towards the future. Sure, it's a fairly basic shonen message for the series, but it being presented in a way that took the idea of like anxiety and fear itself and making it some actual real madness, a force that flows through and corrupts the world along with the people in it, was really fun and created some absolutely amazing shots of characters falling into that madness, and following up those shots with some really great character writing to bring it all home. It may be a shonen ass shonen, but fuck if I care, it's still like a 9 out of 10 to me. All this said and done, I don't think the series is exactly perfect by any means. There are some plot beats that feel more bland than others, some characters who feel left behind or overall pointless, and that same fresh writing sometimes taking a walk on the esoteric side, the metaphors for madness and soul connections filling characters' thoughts. I never really mind this writing style, I spent the whole last video praising Oh Great's writing, who am I to talk shit? But I know that does turn some people off. The only major complaint I have that's worth mentioning is the final battle on the moon consisting of a bunch of boring clown moon bunnies felt like filler almost. Sure, I totally get what they represent and how the Kishin's madness pouring from the moon was spawning them in like an endless Call of Duty match, but at the end of the day, they're just fodder enemies to fill pages with combat while the more important matters happen on the other pages. Also, the witches as a group feel a bit left out of the overall story. Like yeah, Medusa and Arachne play major roles in the plot, but the actual witch coven itself feels more like a background element as the series progresses on, the enemies of the story taking way more importance than the initial battle for witches' souls to become death weapons. They do have their moments. Kid has a great scene with them towards the end of the series, and the stuff with Jackie isn't bad at all. But usually they're kinda just chilling somewhere in the world most of the time doing their own things. Not the biggest deal, but just a thought I had after finishing it. Anyway, those minor complaints aside, I really do think the story of Soul Eater and the extremely interesting focus on madness as a real concept and what it can do to people, both in a negative and positive way, make for a really fun story that feels super unique when compared to a lot of its shonen peers, all backed up by one of the sickest art style aesthetics there's ever been in manga, period. And just like with the art, that same dope ass style was translated almost perfectly to the anime adaptation for Soul Eater. 
So finally, let's get in there and talk about the thing that no doubt most of you probably came for. The Soul Eater anime was released in 2008 by studio Bones and Aniplex, with the lead director being Takuya Igarashi, a dude whose career started over at Toei and now has his fingerprints all over Bones anime. Him actually directing a large chunk of Oran High School Host Club and has most recently headed up the Bungo Stray Dogs adaptation. I've said it before in this video and I'll double the fuck down now, Soul Eater is absolutely as popular as it is worldwide due to this anime, and for a good reason. It's a fantastic adaptation. Covering around the first 14 volumes of the manga, the anime adapts the plot one-to-one -one based on the chapters that had been released at the time, and it does so with extreme style. Flashy and expertly animated combat scenes, wild and vivid color direction. The team completely understand how the world should be designed. And probably most importantly in my book, one of the best, and I mean the best, anime OSTs ever released. It being created by Taku Iwasaki, the motherfucking king who composed Black Butler, Jojo Part 2, and Gurren Lagann's OST. Yeah, this is the row row fight to power, dude. No shit the OST for Soul Leader went so hard. The man is physically unable to ever stop going in like he's rich homie Kwan. And with Soul Leader, you got so scandalous, bang bang bang, psychedelic soul jam, never lose myself. Like, I can't stress this enough, I've said it in my Trigun video, my Helsing video, and here I am again. Anime OSTs absolutely should use more lyrics in their songs, dude. They're always more memorable for me and end up on my casual playlists way more often than OSTs without them. And doubly so when motherfucking Lotus Juice shows up, baby! You know I'm a Persona 3 diehard, so him being here is like a seal of 10 out of 10 quality. And that's not to discredit either of the OPs or endings. Residents and Paper Moon are emo kid jams that I'll die defending. And I'm sure the 30 million or so of you out there will as well going by the numbers on these official YouTube uploads. Aside from that, this banger OST was backing up some of the coolest fight scenes of the mid-2000s, the animation always staying extremely fluid and full of motion and flow that's extremely easy to follow characters landing blows while having subtle changes in their facial expressions, the positioning of the weapons in their hands changing mid-fight. It's all super meticulous and carries that minute-to-minute -minute weapon combat of the manga perfectly into the anime. Like at the end of the day, I have literally zero complaints about any of the fight scenes in the show. But for all this praise I'm giving it, this wasn't really my thoughts during the initial watch I had talked about earlier. After peeping that first episode at my friend's house and continuing on my own, it was probably around episode 15 to 16 where I kinda started to fall out of wanting to keep my watch going. And it was for a few reasons. Now this was at least like 10 years ago and I was a lot more jaded and cynical about things then, only well, watching anime dubbed because <laughs> I'm not that much of a weeb to where I'm gonna read subs. Uh, yeah, that sure stayed true. Please pay no attention to the 3,000 plus manga collection and ignore the fact that I've only watched two dubs in like six years. And they weren't even like regular anime. They were cyberpunk edge runners and space dandy. Got a video on that show out now if you're interested. Oh, also, when I was switching to English when Dr. Tenma was on screen in Pluto because he was goddamn Keith David, man, what a perfect casting for a perfect anime anime. But anyway, in 2013, I was a total loser who still liked to act all high and mighty about pointless shit and was quick to find reasons to trash on something. So during the dub for Soul Eater, despite all my praise towards him earlier, I kinda hated Blackstar. He was so fucking loud and annoying and just obnoxious to me, acting like a quote unquote dumb kid and turning me off hard from him. Following that up, you had Maka's dad Spirit, who I already thought kinda sucked anyway, but the one-two combo of both how they voiced him, combining with Spirit as a character, yeah that shit was strike two. And the final strike, the one I still kind of agree with, was that I thought the comedy in the anime was kinda bad. Like I don't know, it felt stunted and forced to me, this one song being used to hammer home the goofy moments and I, 
uh, it just felt off. After those three strikes, I ended up dropping it for like another three years, trying the anime again in 2016, but subbed this time. Switching over to Japanese did remove two of my complaints, the Black Star and Spirit voices, but kept the same stunted comedy beats while also creating a new personal issue. <laughs> And this is one I don't mean to sound like a dick about, but the actress who voiced Maka, Chiaki Omigawa, was very obviously fresh talent, this being her first voice acting role in general. And, uh, you can kinda tell, Maka going from the always fantastic Laura Bailey and now sounding kinda bad, and I ended up dropping the show again. Like I said, not trying to shame a first time VA, and checking on her record now that she's done characters who I love, so obviously this is a complaint that no longer exists. But now, six to seven years later after that last attempt, I finally watched the whole dubbed anime for this video. And my take now in 2023 is, yeah, it's great. Blackstar's English VA rules and I was just being dumb. Like his voice was a perfect match. Spirit still sucks, imagine that, the voice is a perfect fit! The big two stars of the dub for me though are easily Death and Excalibur, with Death being so bubbly and happy but still getting serious when needed, and Troy Baker Excalibur was just like, perfect. I randomly catch myself still going FOOL or singing EXCALIBUR because goddamn the dude nailed the exact energy for Excalibur's dumbassness. I still do think a lot of the comedy bits don't hit as well as the manga, but eh, whatever, that's personal, that's just me. The anime does end on a filler conclusion that alters the final events of the show pretty greatly from the manga, and at the risk of sounding like the generic weeb I said I would never become in 2013, it is a pretty bad filler ending and doesn't compare to the manga in any way at all. Wrapping the Kishin conflict with no real buildup and also changing the best fight in the series, Black Star versus Mifune, so that's unfortunate. You're probably wondering why I spent so much time talking about my experience with the anime over discussing the show itself brick by brick, but I mean, what the fuck could I even say? Yeah, it's great, minus the filler ending, I big recommend it. Like, you already know what the fuck's up, there's been dozens of videos about this anime specifically. People online for years now have been begging for some kind of Soul Eater Brotherhood situation, an anime reboot to cover the entire series. Which is fitting because not only did Full Metal and Soul Eater run side by side in Gon Gon, Bones made both of the Full Metal anime, so the hope in people's hearts makes sense actually. <laughs> And while I personally don't know if we'd ever get that lucky, I still think it's extremely cool this manga that was built in its foundation to be so stylish got an anime that properly captured that aesthetic at all, even if it was incomplete. Some real luck of the draw type shit. There is also a 5 volume spin-off manga and anime, titled Soul Eater Not, which started around the time volume 20 of Soul Eater was in development. Being so far into the main story, Okubo had begun to regret not spending more time earlier laying out all the ideas he had for Death City and the DWMA itself, so he created a side story that was more focused on the school life and the actual way the world functions, the main character Sumugi Harudori, a demon weapon, being in the NOT classes, which stands for Normally Overcome Target this actually being the normal non-combatant classes the DWMA has, while the Soul Eater crew are placed in the EAT classes, that meaning especially advantaged talent, them very rarely ever interacting with the NOT classes. With Sumugi being on the normal side of school, she spends most of her time doing school shit, hanging with her two Meister friends and living a school life in this wacky setting. Yeah, if you, if you can't tell, Not is very much more a slice of life in this weird ass world than it is a battle shonen. And while it does have a plot that focuses in on an evil third sister of Medusa, the main point is to just show off the DWMA in an actual classroom and school sense, and in that way Way, I think it's fine. Like, it's not something that's required for reading Soul Eater overall, and it's 
very laid back, so if you just want some slice of life that takes place in a Halloween world, this is here for you. And if you want to pass it up, honestly, I think that's fine too. Lastly, when it comes to how you should read or watch the series, there's a few ways. The manga has two separate print runs in North America, the original single volume Yen Press releases and the newer hardcover Square Enix Perfect Editions. Between the two of them, I have the entire series, it's actually how I'd read it both times for this video. And from my recommendation, I really like the new Perfect Editions. Taller than a regular volume, really solid page quality, and there's a bright contrast between the white spaces and the shaded areas, and also having every color page in the series, which means a lot to me personally. They're like one and a half volumes each technically, so there should be around 17 when it's all over, and if you don't feel like doing that, the in-press print is still totally findable out there as well if you want the singles. So you do you however you do. Oh, and the anime is on Crunchyroll, super available by Blu-ray, and also online in any other way possible you can imagine, so you do you times two. <laughs> All of that said and done, there's one more thing I'm sure diehard fans of Okubo are expecting me to talk about, and for good reason. <laughs> But when it comes to Fire Force and the reasons it would be talked about here, along with bringing Biichi back up, I'm actually gonna save that for another time and another video because that's, that's a whole lot, that's a whole other video in its own right. So while we won't be talking much here about Okubo's only other remaining manga Fire Force, him actually announcing at the end of its publication that it would be his final series, but thankfully I can say that I really enjoyed it as well. And I I think it's worth your time. It's different in a lot of ways from Soul Eater. I've seen tons of people try it based on their love for this series and bounce the fuck off of Fire Force. But I don't know. I think if you vibe with the actual core of what Soul Eater is, I'm sure Fire Force will catch you on some level. Also has one of the best fights I've ever read in a manga, but like I said, another time. <laughs> It's a shame we may never get another series from Okubo if what he said holds true. And as always, who knows what the future can hold. But it is super dope that both of his big two series are as beloved and enjoyable as they are. Bro made peek and said, let me quit while I'm ahead, and I can't blame him at all. <laughs> There's also a currently airing anime called Kami Arabi God dot app. <laughs> Hell, to be fair, it may be over by the time this video is even out. And I haven't watched it myself because the premise about a high school battle royale to become God is so overdone that it doesn't really interest me. But Okubo did all of the character designs and his recent artwork of them is fucking fantastic. So there's that if you're interested in what his most current style looks like. <laughs> Sorry the Halloween drop was late as hell again. These videos keep ending up longer than I mean them to be. I thought this would just be like a 14 page script. Nah bitch, it's 20. <laughs> but if you take anything away from this at all, it should be that Halloween based manga are cool as fuck and we need more of them. Shout out D Grey Man. If that shit ever ends, it'll be getting a video. Bet your ass I'll be there. See you next time with whatever's next. We're cooking up multiple things at once over here. Hit the buttons, like, sub, all that shit and thanks for watching and shout out to my patrons who supported me all through 2023 and now going into 2024 we've got our tartic my first one who's been here since 2022 that's the dude we've got jack hober we've got dead inside we've got manga alerts who if you know you know he's got the sick hookups on manga on twitter go peep him We've got Nick with the Father Anderson profile pic. The one and only Tara K. Crescent who gave me my first fan art ever on Twitter. I still look at that every once in a while and I'm like, damn, that exists. Shout, shout out you, you the best. We got Bang Bang in the Mouth. We got Azure CD who claimed the Axel role from my last video. There's 13 of y'all motherfuckers right now and Azure CD gets to be Axel. Shout out them. We got Marty Noob. We got G Babe. We got Almighty Lantern, one of my comic mutuals on Twitter. Twitter. Appreciate all the recommendations throughout 2023. We've got Doom Thing One, who's been here for almost a year now. Appreciate you. And last, but absolutely not least, shout out Tim Petro. Y'all 13 sons of bitches are the realest ones out there. I would die for all of you, probably, but for real. Big gratitude towards you guys, honestly. Hopefully I can make 2024 worth your patronage. Since this is technically in December, everyone have happy holidays, happy Halloween. See you in 2024, YouTube, let's fucking go. Let's explode 2024. 2023 was great. Let's keep it going, baby. What? <laughs>